I'm so glad you could join us at Timberlake Online. Service will get started in just a few minutes, but first, if you're new with us today, there are a ton of ways for you to get engaged in service and get connected. Check out our built-in Bible and message notes, which you can use to follow the message later in service. I'd also like to encourage you to fill out a connection card to help us know you were here. It's also the first step in your next right step with your walk with Jesus. You can also let us know of any questions, comments, or prayer requests there. Lastly, don't forget to bookmark this page so you can find us again next week. And with that, there's really only one thing left for you to do, and that's come on over to chat, say hi, let us know where you're tuning in from. I'll see you there.
Welcome to Timberlake. My name is Hung and I'm on the hospitality team. Whether you're joining us online or at one of our physical locations, we're so glad you chose to join us today. If you haven't already downloaded our app, check it out. It will help you fully engage in the service. If you select the connect menu option in the app, you'll find message notes, giving options, and even a way to sign up for events or groups that are coming up. You'll also find a connection card. Please fill out as much information as you're comfortable with. We'd love to know that you are here and help you find your next right step. When you give, it not only changes our community and world, but it changes our hearts as together we seek to put God first. As we get closer to the end of the year, we want to finish strong in our giving as a church. Your tax-deductible year-end gift will make a life-changing difference as more people experience the hope and good news of Jesus. Learn more and watch powerful stories of lives changed and communities impacted at TimberlakeChurch.com slash give. God has brought over 60 different nationalities into our Timberlake family. Even with our many different languages and cultural backgrounds, God continues to give us unity as a church family. And we want to recognize and celebrate that we are diverse in culture, but united in Christ. Join us Sunday, January 9th at any of our regular service times for our International Sunday as we enjoy special food, creativity, and music. You will not want to miss this memorable Sunday together. At Timberlake, groups are how we stay connected. Being a group host isn't about having a clean home. It's about making space for connection. We'll provide you with all the tools needed to host a group this winter. For more information or to sign up, visit TimberlakeChurch.com slash groups. For more information and to get connected, download our app or visit us at TimberlakeChurch.com. We'd also love to connect with you on social media. I hope you enjoy the rest of the service. Thank you for joining us today. joyful noise this morning to sing out to God, praising Him, lifting His name up. Come on, everybody. Oh, yeah. Sing, this is the day. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. Come on, clap those For hands. For all my hope. In your name, and now your joy awaits my praise. I give thanks for all you have done, and I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing, Lord. I am grateful. Set my feet on solid ground So here I stand You are my God And your faithfulness My solid rock So 
declaration over this house this is a new song it says this is a house of worship this is a place of praise where all the darkness trembles where we proclaim your name this is a house of healing our hearts are full of faith you have our full attention you have the final Come alive 
in the name of Jesus, come alive in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. Come on, if you can receive that and believe this is a house of miracles, why don't you clap those hands if you believe that in the house? Yeah. There's resurrection power. Yeah. Your blood runs through our veins. Yeah. Your kingdom triumphs over. Even the coldest grave So come alive in the name of Jesus Come alive in the name of this Jesus is a This is a house of miracles This house, this house is Everything in the feet of Jesus Everything in the name of Jesus join me in a prayer. God, we thank you for this time that we've had together, singing songs, worshiping together. Uh, We thank you for uh, just this holiday season and time with family and friends. And most of all, we thank you for what it's all about, celebrating the birth of Jesus. I pray that this morning that our hearts would be encouraged, that we would leave challenged and changed and a little bit closer to you today. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Amen. Well, welcome again to Timberlake. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. My name is Shane. I'm on the team here. I hope you had an incredible Christmas with your family and friends yesterday. And I hope that you were able to join us for one of our Christmas Eve services. It was amazing to see how many people showed up. And I've already heard dozens of stories of life change. The team's working on a recap video that we're going to be showing next weekend that you'll be able to take a look at. Well, this weekend, we're going to receive an offering if you'd like to invest financially in what God's doing here at Timberlake. And if you would like tax credit in 2021, make sure your gift comes in before the end of the month. You can give through our app or through our website as well. Uh, We're going to be hearing from Christopher this morning. He is one of our worship leaders. He has a message that I know is going to challenge your hearts today. Before we jump into that though, here is one of the ways that your generosity made a difference in our local communities this holiday season. Check it out. Hey everyone, I wanna thank you for participating in The Giving Tree. It was exciting this year to be able to do this. I was able to contact Jenny and she's here at the Cascade Elementary School. And I want you to listen to the story that she has to say about the family we were able to help this year. To the family at Timberlake Church, I wanna thank you so much. My name is Jenny Fulmer. I'm the family liaison here at Cascade Elementary. And the act of kindness that you have bestowed upon this family is enormous. The gifts that you gave are actually going to a family that came from out of state. They're now in permanent housing. They just got in a few weeks ago, but they don't have anything. So you're giving them a holiday. You're giving them a renewal of faith and showing this great act of kindness. So again, thank you. God bless you. We love you all. Well, hello everyone. I'm so glad you were able to join us online today. My name is Christopher. I'm on the team here. And I hope you had a fantastic Christmas. I hope you got to eat plenty of Christmas ham or if you're a vegetarian, you know, impossible ham or whatever you're into. Uh, But no matter how you spent your time, I hope it was enjoyable and restful. I know personally for me, I had a great Christmas. Uh, My stepdaughter, Riley, she's 19 years old and she's in the Air Force. And for the past couple of years, she's been stationed in Turkey. So we've hardly gotten to see her, my wife, Brandy, and I, and other than like FaceTime. And so she's back in the States now, and she actually visited us for an entire week. So it was so good to see her. And I've got some pictures I'm going to share with you. Uh, I'm, I know I'm going to be that dad who shows you pictures of his kid, forces you to look at him. But you know what? I've got control of the screen, so you're just going to have to endure today. Uh, but, you know, I've helped raise Riley since she was uh, five years old. And so it's just so cool to see how she's grown. And I wanted to test out some of her military training. And so we just did a little sparring. And so there's some pics of us res- wrestling right here. Uh, yeah, you know, we... We like to have a little fun and horse around. Uh, oh, all right, okay, okay. Well, I don't remember that. I think maybe that was Photoshopped or something. But uh, oh, okay, yeah, no, you, know, you know what? Uh, that wasn't a tear that it was raining that day. And you know, I, I'm not gonna go into detail about it, but you get the point. Uh, we like to have fun and we like to enjoy each other's company as a family. But like any family, we sometimes experience conflict. You know, and I remember some of the, the darker times where, you know, long nights and the, the crying and yelling. And that, that was just me trying to help Riley with her Common Core math homework. And so <laughs> uh, anybody that's had to experience that, oh, I, I still have nightmares. Uh, but for real, like any family, we experience conflict. And anyone who's ever lived with a teenager knows all about the drama and the conflict that comes along with that. But that's compounded by the fact that Brandy, my, my wife, and her ex-husband, Riley's father, they're not what we would call besties. And so that just sort of added to the dynamic and sometimes created tension. And so sometimes there would be conflict. And that's what I want to talk about, conflict. Because no matter who you are, at some point in your life, you're going to have to deal with that. Whether it's a, a frustrating coworker or some dude road raging on the highway, maybe your own spouse. Maybe your spouse road raging on the highway. I, Brandy, if you're out there, don't say a word. 
Um, but at some point, we're all going to have to deal with conflict. And so I want to share some principles with you that have helped me over the years to, to deal with this and to be able to handle difficult people and situations. And I like to name my messages. And so I was writing this during the Christmas season, and I decided to call it the Polarization Express. And I think that's kind of a catchy name, but I think it also sort of describes the vibe nationwide right now. It's like the whole country is divided on two speeding locomotives heading towards each other towards certain destruction. And what's disheartening to me is it sometimes seems like the Christian community is contributing to that division and sometimes fueling the fire. And that's really sad because Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And so I think we as the church should take sort of ownership and responsibility for trying to bring peace to these turbulent times. And I'm hoping that some of what we talk about today may be able to help us with that. And I want to be clear from the start that I am in no way advocating that you avoid conflict. I think conflict can actually be very helpful if it's handled in a constructive way. And I also think avoiding conflict can make a bad situation catastrophic, or at the very least, just create some unnecessary frustration and misery in our lives. So that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about today is not allowing conflict to turn you ugly, not allowing it to ruin your personal and professional relationships. I want to show you how to handle difficult people and difficult situations in a God-honoring way. And I feel like I'm sort of an expert on this just because of all the countless times I've handled conflict the wrong way. Listen, I can tell you with the wisdom of a sage what not to do when it comes to conflict. (laughs) So hopefully I can draw on some of my past experience and maybe that will become useful today. And so I want to start with some lessons from the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul was no stranger to conflict. In fact, he may have created a little bit himself in his life because before he was the Apostle Paul, he was known as Saul. And he hated Christians. He fiercely persecuted Christians. This dude was like the LeBron James of hunting down Christians. And I think probably more people like Saul than LeBron, but I'm joking, LeBron people. I'm just kidding. Uh, But after an encounter with Jesus, Saul becomes the Apostle Paul, and he begins to spread the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere he goes. And even 2,000 years later, the global church is still being impacted by Paul's words. And so what's interesting, by the way, um, if, if you are ever worried about um, your past or the mistakes that you've made somehow inhibiting your relationship with God or his ability to use you, please don't be. I think God has the power and he enjoys taking our broken past and turning it into something that is useful and a testimony that can impact the world and serve his purposes. And so I think he's less focused on your past and more focused on your potential. And that's got nothing to do with what we're talking about today. But I wanted to throw that in there while we were on the subject. And so let's get back to Paul. We've got this guy who used to fiercely hunt down Christians. And now he's spreading the gospel to the world. And when you think about the context, you had the Pharisees who were like the religious leaders of the time. And Saul used to be one of them. And now he's Paul. So they hate him because he's like a traitor. And now he's a Christian. They don't like Christians. Where on the other hand, the Christians... They haven't forgotten about his notorious reputation. And so they're a little bit leery about him. And so he's sort of getting it from both sides. So you could imagine that at a few points in his journey, Paul has had to deal with conflict. And so I think that's why it's even more interesting to see what he has to say about that. So let's look at how he handled it, starting with something he said in a letter to the Romans. In uh, Romans 12, 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. And I think that's a pretty concise and straightforward statement, but I think we could break it down even further into three individual points. And the first one being, if it is possible. Now, look, sometimes peace isn't an option. If I'm walking down the street with my wife, Brandy, and some random dude just tries to come up and French kiss her on the mouth, I'm going to pray for him. I'm going to pray that the surgeons can remove my size 13 Nike from, you know, at You get where I'm going with that. But there are just going to be times and circumstances where you just can't live at peace with people. And there's even going to be times when anger is justified. See, the Bible says be slow to become angry. It doesn't say never become angry. Anger can be a powerful motivator to help us address injustices in the world. 
And so you should be angry about human trafficking. You should be angry about inequity. You should be angry with the way that the Seahawks are playing this season. Uh, I know, I know Russell's injury and all that, but I just kind of feel like Pete Carroll's gum is getting stale or something. I don't, maybe somebody needs to get him a fresh pack of Bubblicious. I, I don't know. Uh, okay, that last example isn't nearly as important as the first two. But what I'm saying is that anger itself isn't necessarily a sin or bad. It's what we're angry about and how we choose to respond to that anger that matters. Jesus even demonstrated this in John 2, 13 through 15. Uh, It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. So Jesus went to Jerusalem. In the temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Now, it doesn't really go into detail about the context here, but essentially, They were desecrating God's holy temple with their greed. Jesus didn't really like that too much. And so it goes on to say, Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and the cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. And I just want to stop for a second to just say how cool Jesus is. I mean, come on. He's like a real life action hero. I just kind of picture, my, picture him like kicking in the door with some aviator sunglasses on and a leather biker jacket. Just like you've offended my father and flipping over tables. Just like a complete boss. Um, and hey, you can't prove it didn't happen like that. So just, just let me have this. Just let me view the Bible through my Arnold Schwarzenegger filter, okay? <laughs> but what I'm saying is Jesus got angry And we know Jesus is perfect and holy. So we could deduce that there is maybe a time when we can be angry and it can be justified. And that said, don't go out and get arrested and then call me to testify at your trial or something. I I don't want any parts of your drama. I've got my own problems. Uh, That's not what I'm saying at all. Look, Jesus is holy and so is his anger. Whereas we are flawed human beings who sometimes get it wrong. So I think if you're going to draw on what we'll call a righteous fury to go out and address some injustice, maybe you should tone it down just a smidge, maybe not flip tables, just in case you're on the wrong side of things, right? Now, anyway, I'm trying to drive home the point that living at peace with everyone isn't always an option. Now, Paul knew this, and so he was intentional with his words to make sure that we knew it too. And that first clause does a great job of leading into the second part of Paul's statement I want to talk about, as far as it depends on you. Now, there's just going to be some people in your life who are determined to hate you. There's there's no way to avoid it. They hated Jesus. This is a man who fed the hungry, healed the sick. He cared for widows and orphans. And they hated him so much that they wanted to kill him and eventually did. And so what hope is there (laughs) for us, right? Um, And so there's just going to be times when all you can do is just forgive them and and walk away. Just I bless you and remove yourself from that engagement because they're not going to allow you to be at peace with them. God calls us to some pretty remarkable things, but he doesn't call us to change people. Only God has the power to change people. But what he does call us to do is give our absolute best to make sure that we are living at peace with people. And, and I think if, if you honestly evaluate your actions and your motives, then you know, right? You know if maybe you're not doing your absolute best. You know if you could have handled that situation a little bit better. And you know if you are the problem. I think we all know that. And it takes a truckload of humility and self-awareness to, to recognize that. But I think it's important that if we want to improve our relationships and have less toxicity in our lives in general, we're going to have to take a serious, evaluative look at ourselves. And God can actually help you with that. Here's what you do. You go to an isolated, quiet space. Not right now, after this is over. Uh, Go to a space, close your eyes and just say, God, I want to be a peacemaker. Search my heart. And if there's any area where I'm harboring resentment, any person for whom my intentions might be the slightest bit spiteful or resentful, reveal that to me. And then just be silent and listen. And you might be surprised at what surfaces. Now, in a second, I'm going to talk about some strategies we can use to handle conflict. But first, I want to address that third part of Paul's statement, live at peace with everyone. And if I had to choose which of the three points is the most difficult, Definitely, it's this one. 
Because Paul isn't just talking about living at peace with people who are mildly irritating, like people who touch my head without asking. Like, what is that, by the way? It's just like, what is this, a petting zoo? I feel like people are so obsessed with my scalp and I don't really understand. I, I, I'm sorry. I would take a deep breath. I think I just drove up some, some sort of trauma from my past or whatever. But um, <laughs> everyone doesn't just include people who are annoying. It includes people who have deeply hurt you. People who may legitimately deserve your disdain. And so that's hard. But you know what? Psalm 103.10 says this. God does not punish all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. Have you ever said or done anything that hurt someone? Because I know that I have, and I'm not proud of it, but I'm so glad that God didn't look at me with justified disgust and say, I can't believe you did that. You are a horrible human being. No, he he showed me grace. He, He sent his son to die for me, knowing every horrible thing I've done in my past and every bad thing I ever will do. And he freely extends that grace to every one of us through Jesus Christ. And so maybe we as the church could be a little bit more patient with people, a little bit more forgiving. All right, so if we're going to have this conversation about handling conflict, we need to talk about some strategy, right? And so I've got three biblically-based principles that could help you maybe do your part to keep conflict from escalating and become a peacemaker. First of all, when you find yourself heating up, freeze. Just hit the pause button, right? Don't make a sarcastic remark. Don't quit your job. I've actually done that. That was not a good season in my life. And, and don't craft that, that masterful email. Do you know what I'm talking about? That, that email that you spent like two hours drafting and you read through it like a hundred times and it says just enough to make the other person look like an idiot, but not quite enough to violate any personnel policies or anything. That email. <laughs> Please don't do that because I'm actually, I'm really good at those emails and people do not respond to that. So please, please don't do that. Um, But what I'm saying is take time to sort of let the adrenaline uh, uh, roll down and and just calm down, process the situation. Because when you're you're heightened and you're amped up like that, you're not going to be able to make sound decisions. And we see in in Psalm 4.4, it says, don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. And there's actually some science behind this. See, anger is the body's natural response to a perceived threat. And so when you're angry, uh, we go into what's called fight or flight mode. A lot of you have probably heard that before. But what happens is a physiological process. So chemicals like adrenaline and cortisol get released into your body and they they raise your heart rate and they, uh, they even affect your cognitive function and make it nearly impossible for you to behave and respond in a reasonable, level-headed way. Hence why I act the way that I do when I play video games. Um, Listen, if you ever want to see a 42-year-old man screaming at a TV screen, just stop on by while I'm playing Xbox and I will entertain you for hours. Uh, But even if you think that you have control over those emotions, there's an actual physiological process happening inside of you that you cannot control. So you're better off finding a way to just sort of stop, let all of that get over with, get out of your body, calm down, process the situation, and then come back to that engagement. And that's, that's just something of value that I think is important. And, and it could be something maybe in the office place, like uh, you say, listen, I hear what you're saying, and I think this is a very important conversation. So why don't we set up some time tomorrow? Because I really want to devote the time to hearing your perspective. Now, now doesn't that feel a little bit better than the email, right? It it, it makes that person feel like you actually care about them and what they're saying, and it just gives you a second to to calm down and then come revisit that conversation later. But eventually, you're going to actually have to have the conversation, right? And that leads me to my second point. Don't escalate. Collaborate. We have this tendency uh, to see people that we're in conflict with as our adversaries or enemies, And I think that's the worst thing we could possibly do with handling conflict. So if we want to have more success in our personal and professional relationships, we're going to have to learn to reframe it and see people as a teammate instead of an opponent. 
And something I like to do to help with this is when I'm in conflict with someone, I, I visualize a table. And on either side of the table are chairs. On one side is me and that person I'm in conflict with. And on the other side is the problem. And so it's me and that person working together to resolve the problem. And then I also like to visualize an extra chair just in case I need to hit them with it. But I, I'm just kidding, I don't do that. But it's important to understand that that person is not your problem. And maybe their behavior is a problem, but maybe from their perspective, their behavior is a result of some unmet expectation or a perceived offense. And that's why it's even more important for us to handle things collaboratively because we start to really dig in and find out what's at the root of that conflict instead of addressing what's on the surface. And I know it can be super hard to see someone as an ally when they're in, you know, they've offended you or you're in conflict and disagreeing with them. I think Paul would say this, always be humble and gentle, be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. And I, I see, I see what you're saying right now. I can't even see you, but I know what you're saying. You're saying love, like, I don't love this person. I, I don't even sort of like them. <laughs> I, I get that. I totally relate. But maybe that's part of the problem, right? Jesus called us to love everyone. Remember, be at peace with everyone. Jesus said this, love your enemies, do good to them, lend to them without expecting to be repaid. And you, you see what that is at the end of that sentence? It's an exclamation point. God put emphasis on that. He was saying, listen up, this is a game changer. This goes against everything that the world has taught us. But what good has the world's lessons done for us up to this point? I mean, hop on Facebook, look at a political post and check out the comments. Are you feeling the love yet? Do you feel peace? Right, it's like this, we're on this polarization express, just careening toward disaster without no signs of slowing down. Someone has to be the one to pump the brakes. And I think that's on us as the church. I think we need to take responsibility for that. And I, I, I hope that some of what we're talking about today will help with that. You know what I'm doing? You know what I do when I have trouble finding love for someone that I'm in conflict with? Maybe they're really difficult. I like to just close my eyes, picture them in my head, and say, God, help me to see this person through your eyes as your cherished creation who you love so much you sent your son to die for them. Folks, that's not your enemy. That's God's beautiful creation. It's a human being who has uh, hopes and fears, who has endured pain and needs encouragement. What if you have the opportunity to be the, the one person the entire week who says something kind to them? Maybe their spouse talks down to them, their kids resent them, nobody at work likes them. And then this one ray of light, you, extends grace and encouragement. Now, wouldn't you rather be that person instead of the person that sends the email? Because I would. And, and what might either of those approaches, what effect might that have on someone who's low on hope? All right, so my last strategy that I want to address here, when handling conflict, talk less, listen more. And <laughs> I mentioned this, this verse earlier, but James 1.19, you must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Look, I I can't tell you how many times in my life that I wish I could just jump in a DeLorean, go back in time, and say, Christopher, shut up! Just stop talking. You're going to look like a complete moron. Please just shh, shh. Listening is going to do two things for you. First of all, it's going to keep you from putting your foot in your mouth because you're, you're speaking out of your emotions or you're talking about something without having all the information. Two, it's going to make that other person feel heard and respected. And that is a crucial element to handling conflict in a constructive way. But I want to make sure that I, I differentiate between listening and hearing. Those are two very different things. The hearing is involuntary. You have no choice but to hear sound. Some of you are hearing me right now as you check your Instagram feed. Yeah, that's okay. I'm not judging. Whatever you want to do with the half hour. Uh, but, but listening requires your active participation. It requires a, a genuine effort to understand the other person's perspective. And, and this part will be hard. I, I understand that. It's tough to hear criticism or, you know, when someone's strongly disagreeing with you, that's tough. But try to just take it all in. 
Like, just ask yourself this question. If I put myself in their shoes, is it possible that I could glean any amount of truth out of the words that they're saying? And this, this approach is super helpful because opinions are subjective. You feel so strongly about your opinion, but they feel just as strongly about theirs. And that's why you're bumping heads. Try detaching your opinion from your identity. Lean into the, the discomfort of dissent and really listen to what they're saying. And you might find yourself walking away with seeing the, the world just a little bit differently. I think it's important for us to have our opinions challenged. I think it helps us grow and it refines our belief. So try those three strategies. Hit the pause button, see the other person as a teammate, and then listen for their perspective. And I already, I already know what you're saying right now. I, I can feel it. You're saying, Chris, that all sounds great in church and stuff. Yeah, awesome. But you don't understand how difficult this person is. You don't understand how bad they've hurt me. And look, I more than anyone can relate to that. I totally understand that. It's not fair, right? There needs to be justice. You can't just let them off the hook. Let me tell you a personal story. So when I was 10 years old, my mom married this guy, and it turned out he had a whole separate wife and family that we didn't know about, so that, that didn't last long. But that's a whole other story for another time. But while we thought he was still a good guy, we moved out to this nice neighborhood with him. And it was so cool for me because I had never lived in a nice neighborhood. I was like, whoa, we've been here a whole month and our next door neighbors haven't even tried to rob us. This is amazing. But what wasn't amazing was that I was the only black kid in the neighborhood. So I looked different. I talked different. I came from a whole different culture. And you probably know that kids aren't always accepting of different and so I had a heck of a time trying to make friends. And I, no matter what I would try, they would always end up being mean to me. Now, I'm persistent, so I didn't give up. And, and one day, I'm looking out my window, and I see these kids playing. There's like 15 of them. And I got super excited. I ran outside like, yeah. And I see this girl on the swing set. Her name was Bree. And let me tell you, Brie was that girl, like that girl that all the boys have a crush on. And I was crushing super hard on her. But for, for whatever reason, that day I was feeling a little bit swaggy. Yeah, I was feeling, anybody under 25 is, is swaggy a thing that, you know what, I'm just going to own that, swaggy. And so in my swagginess, I just sort of moonwalk over and sit next to her on the swing set. And I'm like, you know what, I'm going to ask her out. And I, I didn't have any money or a car. I don't know where I thought we were going, but you know, you're 10 years old. And so I asked her to go out with me and she rejected me. And oh, my little, my little 10 year old heart. It's just, I, I couldn't do anything, but just sit on the swing, slumped over, feeling totally dejected. And I didn't notice during this whole time that the other kids were paying attention. And they were starting to sort of converge on the swing set like sharks with blood in the water. And this one kid yells out, she doesn't want to be your girlfriend. You're stupid and dirty. Nobody likes you. And that was just like a punch in the gut. Like my self-esteem was already on the floor and now it's in the basement. I had no choice but to just hang my head and walk home. And before I get out of the playground, one kid calls out, Chris, wait. And I'm like, oh, this is it. This is my chance. They're going to they're gonna feel some compassion for me, and, and I'll make some friends. I'll finally make some friends. And so I turn around trying to contain my excitement, and he just looks at me kind of confused, and he says, you, you got something on your head. I'm like, oh, really? Like, after everything else is going on, now I've got something on my head? Ah, oh, I feel like a complete idiot. And so I lower my head, and he walks up to me, and Oh, he gets about one foot away from me. And he spits right in my face. And all the other kids erupt into laughter. They point and they mock me. It was one of the most humiliating days of my entire life. That was a hard day for me. And I couldn't do anything but just go back home and as I'm in the bathroom, wiping the spit off of my face, I catch myself in the mirror. And I say, nobody loves you. Your dad walked out of you, on you, all the kids hate you. You're worthless. 
And you know what else I said to myself? I said, no one is ever going to make me feel like that again. And so this memory attached itself to my heart like a parasite. It sucked away my joy. It sucked away my self-worth. And anytime anyone said anything that could be remotely perceived as disrespect, it was like they were spitting in my face. And I responded accordingly. I had trouble regulating my emotions. I had trouble building relationships. I had trouble being happy. I couldn't be happy no matter what I did. And all these years later, I don't even remember those bullies' names. So why so many decades later was I still letting them bully me? Listen, the most important thing I want you to take away today is if you want to be a peacemaker, you've got to learn to make peace with yourself. You've got to learn to make peace with your past. Those people who hurt you in your past They don't define your value. God defines your worth. He created you. You know how much you're worth? Jesus is life. God so loved you that he gave his only son to die for you. And nothing anyone ever says or does can change that. And once God revealed that to me, it it changed everything for me. I, 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 I knew my worth and I felt like I didn't have to defend myself anymore because God defends me. He fights for me. We read in Psalm 118, verse 6. It says, The Lord is for me, so I will have no fear. What can mere people do for me? We're going to sing a song about our God, the one who defends us, who fights for us. But I want your participation to be more than just singing. I want you to think about any person, past or present in your life, who's hurt you. And maybe because of that, you're holding on to and harboring resentment. Maybe it's caused a lie to attach to your heart that's devaluing you. Whatever the case may be, I want you to take that painful memory and let go of it. And I know it's not fair. It's not fair. But this isn't about fair. This is about you finally experiencing the peace and the joy that God intended for your life. And so forgive that person and let God lift the weight off of your shoulders. And as we sing this song, make it a declaration for your life that you don't have to fight anymore. God fights for you. And he's never lost a battle.
pray together. God, thank you that you are our champion, that you are big enough to take on any enemy, big enough for any injustice, any pain that we've endured, and big enough that we don't have to fight anymore, that we don't have to defend ourselves, that we can just rest in your presence and experience the fullness and the peace of who you are in our lives. And I know there are some of us that may not have that yet, that may not know you in that way yet. And so with, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I just want to invite you to join me in this prayer. That God, I believe you sent Jesus to die for me. And I declare today and I believe that after the third day, he rose from the dead and lives in victory as our champion. And so I acknowledge my flaws today. I acknowledge that I'm not perfect and that I need you in my life to make me whole and to live out the purpose that you've created me for as your child. And so today I let go of the past. I let go of the pain, of the hurt, and I relinquish control of my life to you. Thank you for offering me freely this grace and this peace. And I can't wait to walk out every day hereafter with you. You are so good. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name today. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I hope this message was encouraging for you and I hope to see you next week. Have a great week. Thank you for joining us and being part of Timberlake Church today. I hope that you found the message practical and are able to implement those biblical truths into your everyday life in order to come closer to and be more like Jesus. But before you go, bookmark this page so you can find us again next week at any of our service times. And I encourage you to visit TimberlakeChurch.com to check out upcoming opportunities, events, ways to take your next right step, and to give. It's your generous giving that allows us to continue in making a difference with how the online community is spreading the love and hope of Jesus. And for that, we thank you. Well, we'll see you again here next week at online.timberlakechurch.com.